Hello, this is uh, Professor McDermott with a video lecture. The topic is Vedic culture. This is the religious culture that springs from the sacred book known as the, the Rig Veda. Um, and this, bro this book was brought to India by a people known as uh, the Aryans. And over time, uh, this culture based on the Rig Vedas wa evolved into one of the great uh, world uh, religions, Hinduism. And so that will be our focus in this lecture. Who were uh, the Aryans? Well, they were a very dynamic people from uh, Central Asia who migrated down into the northern part of India around uh, the year 1500 BC and um, managed to conquer uh, northern India with the help of their great horsemanship. The Aryans were really skilled um, horsemen. Uh, they were very, very good at breeding horses, much better than the Indians. And so, essentially, the Aryans, uh, with their horses, uh, had a, an advantage over the native Indian peoples and were able to overwhelm the Indian peoples of uh, North India. Um, the Aryans were one of the most dynamic peoples that we know about in, uh, in all of human um, history. Uh, the language of the Aryans was called Sanskrit. That's the language of um, the Vedas. And um, Sanskrit has a lot of vocabulary which is uh, held in common with vocabulary in Latin and um, Greek and other uh, Western European languages as well, like English, uh, for example. Uh, has some words that are very similar to Sanskrit words, and that can only mean one thing, that um, the Aryan peoples migrated not just into India, but also into, um, into Europe. And in fact, we know that uh, there was an Aryan uh, migration into uh, Greece, uh, so uh, the Aryans were involved in ancient Greek civilization. And, and there's an interesting connection here. You, you may have heard this term Aryan before if you're familiar with 20th century history and especially the rise of the Nazis um, to power. Adolf Hitler uh, believed that the Aryans had been the bearers of civilization to Europe. They were responsible for Europe uh, becoming a great civilization. And Hitler also believed that the Germanic people were the true Aryans. They were the ones that were um, ethnically closest to the original Aryan people. So in all of his policies, uh, Hitler tried to promote, for example, breeding, uh, reproduction among uh, those who were considered to be more Aryan, and um, other ethnicities, members of other ethnic groups like uh, gypsies and, of course, the Jews, were uh, discriminated against and ultimately um, exterminated because he thought of them as inferior to the uh, so-called Aryan um, Germans. Um, which uh, goes to show you what can happen when um, scholars get carried away and they uh, take a little grain of truth um, and spin it out into um, some kind of broader story that's meant to serve a political purpose. Um, in this case, the grain of truth is that the Aryans were a very uh, expansive people, very energetic people, um, who did come uh, also to Europe from Central Asia uh, early in European uh, history. Uh, the Vedas, there's more than one Veda, by the way. The Rig Veda is the most prominent of the Vedas, but there are others. Um, the Vedas were all composed by priests under the influence of a drink called uh, Soma. <laughs> and uh, this drink must have really packed a punch. Some of the active ingredients were cannabis, opium, and uh, ephedra, which is found in antihistamines. Uh, so the, the Vedas celebrate, among other things, the uh, advantages of 
uh, drinking Soma, and uh, the greatest of the Aryan gods, Indra, uh, is said to have been a, a great uh, Soma uh, drinker. Um, but in any case, um, the Aryans managed to get many Indians uh, involved with, uh, with uh, this Vedic culture, and uh, their presence expanded, their religion expanded eventually into um, central India, where um, the Aryans also settled down, and wherever they were, they um, intermarried with uh, the local people, the indigenous people who were already there. And so that mixture of peoples um, is the source of the modern um, nation of India, and uh, the Vedas are the source of Hinduism. Now, I have to admit that um, I didn't really know much about the Hindu religion when I began preparing this course, and, and, and I always, I, I guess I have to confess, I always thought of it as a sort of strange thing. My image of it was of people worshipping weird-looking statues like the one you see here <laughs> on the slide. But as I studied Hinduism um, in preparation for writing this lecture, I realized that um, Hinduism is actually a very profound uh, philosophy of life, and um, certainly I learned from, um, from studying it, and I hope that you will um, as well. It, it contains some, some very profound psychological insights as well, I think, into um, human character. Now, according to the great Hindu teachers, um, the first part of any human life um, is involved with uh, the pursuit of one's own desires. So they call it the path of desire. Um, now, when you're a child, um, Hinduism tells us, um, you're basically only interested in, in, in pleasures, you know, simple pleasures, like being cuddled, or Skittles, or <laughs> watching Sesame Street, whatever it may be. Um, as a kid, of course, you're only interested in, um, in, in satisfying your own pleasures in general. And uh, the Hindus say this is the first step along um, the path of desire. Uh, but as we get older, and, and, and in our late teenage years especially, um, we start to become interested in uh, becoming successful in whatever way uh, appeals to us. It could, it, it could perhaps be accumulating wealth or becoming a famous uh, performer or, or politician, getting power in some way um, over other people in business or through politics or whatever it may be, whatever one is interested in or through entertainment, uh, let's say. Um, so the pursuit of worldly success is the second step along the path of desire. Um, in which uh, y usually young adults will, will, tr will seek to gratify their wishes for wealth, fame, and power. Now, um, according to Hindus, of course, all of these um, goals ultimately prove to be unsatisfying um, because no matter how wealthy, how wealthy you are, there's always someone who's wealthier. <laughs> if you're famous, that's probably not going to last um, very long. Uh, you see the rise and fall of uh, careers and, and, and stars and, and so forth in the entertainment business, for example. Um, so in other words, this path of desire is, you know, the, these desires are really insatiable. They can't be satisfied. Um, they always leave you wanting more of whatever it is. They're obviously selfish desires and, and temporary. They're, 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 they're not going to last. Um, there's a famous uh, little story or parable uh, called the parable of the man in the well and um, if there's time in our next class meeting when we discuss the the documents on Vedic culture I'll, I'll bring that in and we can um, talk about it um, however <clears throat> even though the path of desire ultimately does not lead to happiness the great Hindu teachers believed that people should pursue it in early life, um, that this was something natural and normal to pursue. Um, but there comes a time, uh, they said, in everyone's life when these desires um, begin to, to wane, that is to decrease, when people realize that um, the pursuit of 
these desires, wealth, fame, and power, or pleasure, uh, is not going to make them happy. And at that point uh, begins the path of renunciation uh, that takes up the rest of one's life, renouncing one's selfish desires, leaving them behind, and um, living life in a new way. So the third step in the life cycle uh, and the first step along the path of renunciation, we are told, is the, the step of duty, um, in which we cease to be interested in our own selfish concerns and we become interested in serving others, serving uh, the broader uh, community, maybe doing some kind of charitable work or even getting involved in, um, uh, in, in government, if, if we're called to that. Um, this step of duty uh, does lead to noble rewards. That is, it is it's more fulfilling than just pursuing one's own selfish um, desires, and it uh, gives one a feeling of um, satisfaction, more satisfaction. But ultimately, uh, Hinduism teaches this: even this path of duty leaves us unfulfilled. And uh, if you've ever tried <laughs> to really help people in the community, you know that this uh, often can be quite frustrating. For example, not everyone wants to be helped. <laughs> not everyone appreciates your efforts to help. Um, and you can get a lot of pushback and so forth and misunderstanding. Um, and so even this is imperfect. So finally, ultimately, um, people should... Hinduism teaches reach the fourth step and the fourth step is nothing other than the pursuit of infinite being infinite knowledge and infinite bliss in other words leaving all the things of this world behind and seeking spiritual goals and and walking a spiritual path uh, getting in touch with infinite being infinite knowledge and infinite bliss which means uh, happiness um, and there are different components of this uh, step. The whole thing is a pursuit of what they called moksha in Sanskrit, which means uh, liberation. Liberation from, from worldly desires, from worldly cares and concerns. Um, and getting in touch with the Atman, Hindus believed, or they still believe, that um, individuals do not have their own individual soul, that every person in the world shares the same soul, the world soul, which is called Atman. This is a major difference between Hinduism and Christianity, for example, which teaches that every everybody's soul is individual and, and that we'll all live eternally as uh, individuals. Um, and by connecting with Atman, uh, one can ultimately be led into contact with Brahman. Now, Brahman is the Godhead. In other words, Hindus have many gods, but Brahman is what lies behind all the gods. It's the essence of, of godness, I guess you could say, um, the Godhead. And so this is the ultimate goal of the path of renunciation, connecting with um, Brahman. Um, now, <laughs> not everybody obviously wants to go on this path of renunciation. Um, here's a quote from a Hindu uh, wise man. Uh, when the fever of desire slackens, the unwise seek to refuel it with more potent aphrodisiacs. In other words, foolish people, when they get to middle age and they feel that their sexual desires uh, uh, waning or, or, or diminishing, uh, they become alarmed and they take aphrodisiacs, which are drugs meant to promote um, sexual uh, activity. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and according to the Hindu teaching, this is, this is a very foolish thing to do. You wonder what they would think of uh, Viagra, uh, for example, uh, the, the common aphrodisiac of today. Um, according to Hinduism, when you feel your desires begin to slacken, you should embrace that. You should let go of all your desires. In fact, um, in the Hindu tradition, it's a very good thing even to let go of all your possessions. Um, and so if you go to, I've never been to India, but I'm told if you go there, 
you will encounter holy men and women who wander um, the countryside begging for food, having left um, their homes uh, to pursue the spiritual life. And these people are called um, San Yasin, San Yasin. So they go to deserted places or wilderness places and they live and they come out only to, um, to beg uh, for food so that they can um, survive. And this lifestyle uh, seems foreign, I'm sure, to many of you. It's, it's certainly <laughs> um, not the way that most Americans would choose um, uh, to live. We want to have a comfortable retirement. But in the Hindu tradition, um, there's this idea that, yes, when, you, when you're on the path of renunciation, when you get to middle age, um, it's, it's a very commendable thing to leave everything behind and to go out and lead this this more spiritual kind of life where you're, you're not attached to worldly things and in a sense you're free to make contact with Brahman, with, um, with God. Um, but uh, even those people who are not sannyasin can still uh, pursue moksha or liberation by practicing yoga. Now this is I'm sure a very familiar term to you. Some, some of you may even practice yoga. It's become very popular um, in our um, society. Uh, this word, the Sanskrit word yoga, actually has a word in English that is related to it. The word is yoke. A yoke is something that an ox would wear around its neck uh, when it is pulling um, a plow or, or, or cart or something like that. Um, so this word yoga implies discipline. It implies imposing a kind of discipline on yourself um, so that you can grow as a person, so that you can achieve moksha, which is liberation uh, from worldly things, and so that you can follow the law of the universe. Now, we've seen this law of the universe concept before. The Chinese call it the Tao. Later, we'll see the Christians call it the natural law. Um, Hindus call it Dharma. This is the law of, of the universe, the law of built into all things and into us um, as, as well. So yoga is a method uh, to teach us dharma, uh, to teach us to follow this law of the universe. But um, what we think of as yoga, kind of athletic yoga that involves stretching and so forth, is actually only one type of um, yoga. There are, in fact, four different methods of yoga. And, and here's where I think the Hindu tradition is very insightful psychologically, because it recognizes that different people have different personalities and um, that they should pursue the spiritual life perhaps in different, in different ways. The, the different methods suit different people based on your personality. Um, so, the first type of yoga is called uh, Janana Yoga. Um, this is for intelligent people, reflective people, um, thoughtful people. Um, and the pursuit of Janana Yoga involves trying to seek religious salvation through knowledge. So, a practitioner of Janana Yoga would read the Rig Veda, he would read the other Vedas, the sacred texts of Hinduism, he would spend a lot of time in studying, or she would spend a lot of time in studying those texts, um, writing perhaps uh, about them, sharing ideas about them. Um, so this is more of an intellectual path, uh, if, if that is the type of person you are. The second type of yoga in the Hindu tradition is called Bhakti Yoga. Now this is for people who really are more heartfelt, you know, <laughs> who wear their heart on their sleeve, who are more emotional. And uh, bhakti yoga involves the pursuit of salvation through love. So someone who's following this type of yoga might have, for example, a statue of a certain god that they like, a Hindu god, and um, they would uh, perhaps uh, pray to the statue, maybe even kiss the statue, offer it flowers, offer it candles or incense or, or what have you. Really try to have an emotional connection to, um, to that God, to praise that God, for example. Um, maybe chant praises to the God and so forth. 
um, to show one's emotional love for that god. That's bhakti yoga. The third type of yoga is called karma yoga. Now this is for those type A personalities, people who always have to be on the go, who are very energetic and like to be doing something all the time. In other words, active people. Karma yoga is the pursuit of salvation through work, through, in other words, through good deeds that, um, uh, that we do for other people. You know, it could be building a house for Habitat for Humanity or working in a soup kitchen or um, whatever, you know, what, whatever it is. Um, this is a way of, uh, of salvation by helping other people, by actively helping them. Karma Yoga. We'll talk more about this concept of karma in just a moment. Finally, the fourth type of yoga, Raja Yoga, this is what we think of in our society as yoga. Um, this type of yoga is for people who are more hands-on, who like to experience the world through their bodies um, and uh, have a very physical connection to, um, to reality. Uh, what are called experimental people that experience the world in a sense through their through their bodies. And so Raja Yoga involves learning how to control one's body, for instance, to um, to monitor one's breathing, um, and also, uh, of course, to stretch <laughs> and adopt different different postures to, to stretch the body to develop um, the body and to to develop mastery of the body and the mind um, so as to become more spiritual in in that sense um, so that's the the kind of yoga we're familiar with but but actually yoga is a fourfold um, practice uh, in 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 the original Hindu religion now back to this idea of karma we said that Karma yoga was yoga for active people who like to do um, good deeds. And um, this leads to the idea of karma, which has become somewhat popular in our society in recent years. You ever hear anybody say, oh, good karma, you know, <laughs> if they do something good, like um, let someone go first through a door or, um, you know, let them go first at a stop sign or something like that. Uh, good karma. Um, well, this idea in Hinduism is simply this. If you do good deeds for other people, in your next life, you will reap the rewards of that. Good karma. Because the Hindus believe in reincarnation. They believe that when we die, um, we don't go to a place called heaven. Uh, and when we die, it's also not the end of everything. They believe that we are reborn as another being, okay? Um, so if uh, you have good karma, if you've done a good job uh, in your profession and been a good family member and you've treated other people well in the community, um, you would be reincarnated as, as a higher type of person. So let's say you were just an ordinary guy or, or gal, you know, who had an ordinary job. And, and did well at it and, and treated other people well. well when, when you were reincarnated, you might come back as a priest or a queen or a, or a king <laughs> or a, a famous entertainer or, or something like that, you know. Um, reincarnation, okay. However, if you have bad karma and have treated other people badly, you might come back as a toad or a cockroach or, or, <laughs> or something bad like that. So the idea is that our good disease, good deeds are rewarded and our bad deeds are punished um, in, um, in the next life. Um, and this idea of karma and reincarnation is closely linked to a system that for many years, for millennia, actually um, helped to organize and structure Hindu society in India. We call this the caste system. Basically, um, until the caste system was abolished um, in 1948, um, if you were born in India, you were born into a certain social class, a, a caste, okay? 
the highest caste was the caste of Brahmins, priests of um, the Hindu religion. They were considered to be um, the highest rank in society. The second caste were the Kshatriyas. These would be soldiers, warriors, um, public officials, government officials, rulers, kings, queens. Uh, these are all the Kshatriya class. The next class below them would be Vaishyas. These would be uh, basically landowners, farmers who own land, or um, people who own stores or, or shops, for example, small businesses and so forth. Um, these would be uh, Vaishyas or, or commoners. Below them would be wage laborers and servants, people who had to work for uh, wages for a living. These people were called Shudras and uh, they served members of um, the higher castes. So these were the original four um, castes. Over time, at the very bottom of society in India, there emerged a caste known as the Untouchables, or Dalits. Um, these people did the jobs that no one, nobody else wanted to do. For example, cleaning out latrines, burying dead bodies, and, and, and so forth. And they were considered to be unclean um, to the point that nobody else, nobody from any of the other castes, would touch them or even allow their shadow to touch them. Um, so they became known as um, the untouchables. Um, over time, also, each caste developed many, many sub-castes, so that eventually there were thousands of these groups. And so basically, if you were born, um, when you were born, you knew exactly what your job was going to be. Um, essentially, everybody did the same jobs that their family members had done for generations or and generations. Um, there was no way to get out of your caste. You simply could not change um, your caste. There's basically only one example in history of someone who changed caste, and that was the Buddha, uh, who we'll talk about in, uh, in a future lecture. Um, but uh, he's the exception that proves the rule. Essentially, everybody else, you were stuck in your caste, you couldn't change it, and you couldn't even marry out of your caste. You had to marry someone else from your group. Um, so this was a very rigid system, very, very uh, strict system, but it was also accepted by the Hindu people, uh, the Indian people, for uh, many, uh, many centuries until the Indian government uh, tried to abolish it after independence, uh, after they achieved independence from Great Britain. Uh, but still have not been totally successful. People are still clinging to this to this way of life, even several decades later. But um, I think I will leave it at that because we will have a document on the caste system, so we will talk about this uh, more fully um, in our next document discussion. <laughs>